Barbados or a thing uh, is the intangible cultural heritage of Barbados and the exhibition is really about putting Barbadians in touch and helping them to acknowledge the elements of our culture and heritage which are intangible cultural heritage which have been handed down through our generations and which are still being practiced in some form or fashion today. Not everything is practiced in the original form, but there is some part of that which is being kept alive by some traditional community or some sort of enclave in Barbados which is in some way connected to that. So we're not trying to teach Barbadians their intangible cultural heritage because intangible cultural heritage is inherent practice. We're more or less trying to educate them and to get them to acknowledge that it exists so that they're practicing it mindfully and with an understanding that they're in fact by that practice preserving a critical part of our heritage and culture. So this is a greater, like what my grandmother would have used, that is a greater, like what is still being used in Barbados today because although you can buy a mix master or a shredder or all those different things or spiralizer, we are accustomed to a certain consistency for certain dishes and people still prefer them when they're made the old way. So for example, if you go and you have your sauce, we want ham chipped cucumber, we don't want pulverized cucumber, that <laughs> kind of thing. So same thing here. And again, um, the way how housewares and so on have morphed and, and, and what we make from different things. So we've got a mortar and pestle and people who are making their own herbal remedies at home will still use that. Um, people who follow the Rastafarian faith, for example, they believe in homeopathic remedies, lots of different remedies. They are still using things like the mortar and pestle. That is a cuckoo stick. It is possible to make microwave cuckoo now, but traditional cuckoo is either made with a cuckoo stick like this or maybe a wooden spoon like what my mother would have used. But the tradition is still very much alive and that is why these things are here in this, this display case to sort of fuel that conversation. So um, these pots here now, as you can see, the, the one on the left, which is quite rusty looking, that is obviously made from like an old soup can or an old milk can or so on. This one is obviously something that's crafted by maybe a tinsmith or so on. But what these are is that you, we have what we call a pint pot, a gel pot and so on. And every year at Christmas, that is what we are still using to measure peas for our traditional Christmas dishes like jug jug and dove peas. We do not, you're not going to go anywhere and buy a kilogram of peas. You buy a pint, a gel, a, right. So those are still in use, it's still very much a uh, as a Christmas tradition, as, but we're still using those things. Again, um, working class families would have used enamel cook, um, plates and cups and so on regularly we've sort of gone and we're buying the commercialized stuff right now this is more again of a, a culturally specific use like for example if you go to certain establishments like rum shops and so on sometimes you will still get your food and your drink in these because it's a kind of a cultural thing to do if you go to kaduma that is a rum top for when you're jumping on the road and I will show you actually, we actually have this year's run top over there when we get to the festival section. But basically, these are things we still do. Now looking again at how the artists are helping us um, both document and keep these traditions alive and, and sort of celebrate them. This is the work of Juliana Ennis, which she would have talked to where she did her stuff here. She uses traditional methods like hand building um, in quite a lot of her work, but she also uses Barbados Scotland clay, um, both the red clay and the white. The white is a little more rare, but it is there. And basically, so she's using traditional techniques. She also uses more modern techniques, don't get me wrong, so she does a rock and one as well. But basically, hand built pottery, and also she etches her history on these pots and these wares. So basically, um, elements of the worry board, uh, the Serpentine streetscape of Bridgetown from which we got her World Heritage designation. All of these things are featured on her work. This is just a small sampling of what she does. But again, it, it, it links back to, to our traditional use of these ceramics as, as everyday things. So we have our, our, our connery jar, we have our monkey pot. This will be used both to keep water cool and so on during the day. Um, usually when you see them darkened like that, it also means that they've been heated at some point in time, maybe used as a kettle or whatever. But basically, they were very much um, things that we would have used once upon a time. Um, 
something like this, for example, I know in some households was used when you're putting down your fruit to make your Christmas cake and you're soaking it in whatever type of alcohol, rum or cake, wine or whatever that you would have used. So coming along the room here now, I'm talking again a bit more about both the cooking in the kitchen as well as the traditional crafts. We have a selection of cookbooks which privilege um, our Barbadian recipes and the way how we've traditionally prepared food. And these actually are two new additions to the exhibition. These are adult coloring book. One is an adult coloring book and one is a children's coloring book. But they basically, um, each page has a bit of information about the indigenous or at least culturally relevant um, plant or fruit or vegetable that we be used as a part of our cooking. And you'll get a closer look at these. Uh, we have some of these in the shop so I can show you after. Uh, so that you can leaf through and sort of under the display case. So, coming in now to um, traditional craftsmanship. So, we would have done cabbage pan baskets once upon a time, and obviously we're not using them in the way how we would have used them one time where they would have been everyday usage, but what they've morphed into now is more of a type of a, a fashion statement as it were. So, this is a more modern iteration of a cabbage pan, but as you can see, they've gotten creative with how it's woven. It's reinforced with um, leather or leatherette. And uh, again, this is just a sample, which I, I use this one on purpose because these were done as a commemorative thing for our 50th anniversary of independence. But there's actually a full display of these in different styles of handbag and so on um, in our shop as well, just so you, and, and they sell because that has a diversity because you know, it's, it's more of a fashion statement now as opposed to a daily use type of thing. So, coming over here, and I'm going to just pop my phone somewhere in school. I should not really put it here, but don't tell anybody to put it there. But this is rather an interesting story now. So, um, our chapel house is a traditional building method that is indigenous to Barbados. As you know, we were a very land poor country in the post, in the, in the post emancipation period. So basically, if you were working on a plantation and you needed to move, you needed to be able to literally take your house with you. So our movable house, with its very, very colorful, this is actually a print that was developed and is being sold at one of our local stores just before the pandemic. And ever resourceful, when the pandemic came along and people started using local prints to make colorful and creative masks, the originator of the print did not like this large print. So especially for masks, but it's being used for other things now. She designed a smaller version of the print. And this is a little clutch bag, and this is a purse. But basically, as you can see, and this material is what we would call um, like very, very close to a crocus bag material. And speaking of materials, this now is what we call burlap, which would have been the sacks that you would be carrying um, provisions um, from, from produce in and what it is now it is a fashionable clutch bag take up your evening and um, what she's also done is she privileges not just that traditional material and modernizes it for you know the woman of 2020 but she also privileges our traditional expressions in our language so not me bozy and not just language but again here is our chapel house and this is my personal favorite. Um, when you're irritated about something in Barbados, we basically do what you call a strip. So that's, a, that's, just, that's what this is. So, like I said, artists keeping our traditions alive. And then now uh, this is the work over here of Ashanti Trotman. He is a master craftsman, a master carver. Uh, this is actually a picture of him here at work on this panel, which talks again about our, our creativity with regards to making things. But uh, that is a dung basket. This is um, cane that we used to make cane furniture. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But basically, his business is called Remnant, and it is called Remnant because he started out using what we would call the off cuts from local wood to make, as you can see, beautiful things. So he is both a carver documenting our history. So this is actually um, a scene for a top band here. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get around to talking about festivals and the way how music and so on has integrated with our, our cultural life, but also a ceremonial school with this beautifully charged um, curved leaf work and a more functional piece, which is a, a bowl that you can store things in and display. Uh, and all of these are the work of the same person 
And as you can see, he's using traditional techniques to create that. And these are knowledge and skills that these artists are more than willing to pass on because they are practicing this, believe you me, for the joy of it. And don't get me wrong, they're all quite successful. Everybody we featured here has been successful. But they're still, to a certain extent, a niche market because you know, culture tends to be a little bit low-key compared to other things. And these are some of the traditional tools. So this is a selection of wood planes, which would have been used for trimming down the wood. And just to draw a little bit of attention to the use of these tools, this is actually an excerpt now from one of our poets, um, Edward Kamal Braffitt, talking about his uncle, who was basically a woodcraft person. So it says, my uncle made chairs, tables, balanced doors on dug out coffins, smoothing the white wood out with plain and quick sandpaper until it shone like his short-sighted glasses. The knuckles of his hands were silvered knobs of nails hit, hurt and flattened out with a blast of a heavy hammer. He was not kneed, flat-footed, and his clip caught sandals slapped across the concrete flooring of his little shop where cane field mule men and a fleet of 10 Bedford lorry drivers dropped in to scratch themselves and talk. There was no shock of wood, no beam of light mahogany his saw teeth couldn't handle. So there's this very strong visual image of a bit of village life being done there, but it speaks to both his uncle's skill as a master craftsman, but also as a shop, as a gathering place for the other people in the village who were working. And that is what I mean when I say our artists help preserve those bits of our culture and heritage for us to hand down. And then we went on to this now, we're basically looking now at those literary agents, the people who privilege our literature as a part of their work. So these are some playbills of some of our productions. As a matter of fact, Tales of the Forest would have been done at the museum, and that was literally talking about folklore, folklore characters that you get, not just in Barbados and the rest of the Caribbean. Um, it did not get the audience that it could have gotten because it was COVID times. It was done literally during the middle of a lockdown but it still went out to a quite wide virtual audience because it was an international conference in Barbados at the time and they did a recording of it for a part of their opening ceremony. This is Nala. Um, he is, he calls himself the Two Dollar Philosopher. He's a local comedian, actor, activist. He's an artist as well. But uh, we surrounded him by Barbadian sayings and their translation and also some idiomatic bits of Barbadian language just to remind people of, of who and what we are. An interesting thing about our language as it relates to ICH as well. Barbadians are practicing ICH every day, but they're not doing it with any sense of awareness, which is what this exhibition is about. The idea is not to teach them their intangible cultural heritage, but to help them recognize the intangible cultural heritage that they're already practicing because then they can celebrate it, they can enjoy its use, they can pass it on to their children mindfully, they can pick it out from all the other things that they do every day as something that is special and unique and national about us. So uh, this is a very interesting thing here now. This is um, a really huge unit. I don't know if either of you have seen these, but they would have been in England as well as here, I'm sure. Um, but basically, what was really huge, and this was, I guess, for want of a better way, putting a cable radio um, in the last century in Barbados. It was uh, anybody who had a radio fusion unit in their house, people would gather to listen to the news of the world, also some local programming, and it would be a place where people would gather and discuss current events, and generally experience community life. So in 2022 now, we are a little more divorced from each other. We're living in separate houses. The villages, the houses are further apart. Everybody's online now. But Community Village Radio is still, if I can get it to start from the beginning, is still very alive and well because we have evolved something called a call-in program where basically people just call into the radio station to discuss the current events of the day. About the only thing missing from this call-in program that you would go ahead and the and the village setting is perhaps a couple of curse words and some more colorful language. Because of course they've got to be politically correct so that the radio station doesn't get sued. But apart from that, this discussion is pretty much like a discussion you will get in any rum shop on a Saturday and what would have been around the radio fusion back in the day of century ago. So 
we're not using the ready future name where we graduated to our topic, but we're still participating in that community, in that discussion, in that current affairs, activism, whatever you want to call it. So coming back down here now, we've moved into the living room, what we used to call the front house in Barbados. So, and this is again a way how we're, do, we're doing something that we're doing it completely differently. Back in the day, we would have had our cane modern furniture. That's the cane that I showed you on the wall over there. That becomes this. Uh, so these are some cane frames here, which people would have been using just to work on. And what's happening now? Well, there's still a few people with this furniture. It's very expensive antique furniture now. Uh, there are people who can repair it. There are people who still make it. Um, but it's more expensive, a lot more rare. But what we do have, this is the work of Craig Yearwood, and these are actually earrings made from the same cane material. These are actually mine. <laughs> um, but basically, and he also does actually some very lovely high end handbags as well. But this is another way in which a traditional craft has evolved into something which is still relevant and practiced in 2022. So another way, again, in which our artists are preserving our intangible cultural heritage, which is, um, like I said, a theme that runs through this exhibition. And then here's perhaps one of my favorite things. Um, yes, we have coffee table books, <laughs> but I'm going to go through them one by one. So this one is a graphic novel called Hard Ears. Um, and if you remember, I told you earlier about my student who is interested in anime and so on. So the characters in this book are all pulled from local culture um, or folklore and so on. But the story is set in a future, a future island, very much like Barbados, called Bimshira. And if you know, Bimshira is an old-fashioned name for Barbados. So again, using those cultural markers, those cultural references, but to tell a very modern story. So this is a depiction of Mr. Harding. Mr. Harding was a figure um, who was a sort of a personification of hard times and, and struggle. And what happened is that every year, we used to burn Mr. Harding at the end of the sugar crop. <laughs> Similar, I think, to what you guys do with Guy Fawkes. We used to do that too, but we did away with Guy Fawkes a number of years ago. We don't know, we don't really burn Mr. Harding, I don't know, though there's a song about him, there's a song called Burn Mr. Harding, Burn Him. Um, but basically, we also have, for example, the land ship featured in here. Uh, the land ship is actually the military force of the island, and they use the drum and the beat and the chant as their way of fighting or their way of, of repelling adversaries, which I think is a very clever way of using what they are and who they are, but to tell that story in another different way. Um, Another um, creature in here is also the Barbados raccoon, now extinct a number of years. As Maharka, I've never set eyes on one. But again, they have worked all of that back into the graphic novel, which as you can see, is very well drawn, very modern. And so that's, that's item number one, how we're keeping our heritage and culture alive through what I would call the literary arts. This now is a novel called The Mask of Bimshur, again, that relevance to Bimshur, all of the languages Barbadian dialect. It uses um, lots of cultural markers, lots of signposts. So Barbadian place names, Barbadian Christian names, names that you would recognize as somebody that you've gone down the street and spoken to. And lots of elements of Barbadian culture shine through this work again. Um, the very name Offset, that is um, a Barbadian saying, means that you've been discommoded or inconvenienced or discombobulated in some way. So. And this is a sort of an adventure crime story, once again, sort of speculative fiction, shall we say, using our folklore, our Barbadian heritage, history, and culture. This one is actually, we sort of snuck this one in here. This is not a Barbadian, but it is somebody who fell in love with a part of Barbados's intangible cultural heritage to the extent that he did a wonderful job of documenting what makes it what it is. So it's called Chapel Houses of Barbados and it's written by Jose Javier Lagara. And what he actually did is he came to Barbados as an architect. He was fascinated by this thing called the Chapel House that he'd never seen before. And the more he learned about it, the more fascinated he became. He became his, his hurricane resistance, his, all these things, is movable. He's never seen that type of house before. He went around the island and mapped all the Chapel Houses he could find. 
and then he, he learned about the history and he did a little plot of history for us. And then he started talking about the types of plot of land, what types of things you would find. So this is a, a standpipe. There's still remnants of standpipes. They don't all look like this. We've actually got one up there, I'll show you, um, on the museum grounds. So they, they, they don't all look like this, but quite a few of them did. And basically he documented, you know, the road would be winding, it's not a good layout and so on. And lots of different things. So this would be like how the house is packed down and moved from one place to the other. And just as a side note, there's actually legislation in Barbados that speaks to when and where you can move one of these houses. I have not seen one moved in a very long time, but once upon a time you could only move them like on a Sunday evening when the traffic was low, because literally they would take up the entire width of the road. Um, when I was a child, they would be on donkey carts. As I grew older, it would be a truck or a lorry. Like I said, um, they tend to be more permanent structures nowadays. So like once upon a time, these would be limestone blocks which could move with the house. Usually there's a built foundation now and the houses do not really move because they don't really need to move anymore, but they still have that hurricane resistant design where everything is symmetrical with the idea that then when you have your flaps, the wind is going to blow right through instead of blowing the house down. And um, I, I just to do a little personal anecdote, I remember being at home in a really, really horrible storm of time and there was a house across from where I was living at the time and I spent the entire night at my window watching this house waiting for it to blow down because it was already leaning on a side. When the sun came up next morning and the storm had passed, the house was still there but lots of modern construction elsewhere in the island had lost their roof or they had, had they sustained damage. And the house had not so much as lost a roof out of the door flaps. And the house was leaning. It didn't have any paint. The galvanizer was rusty. But that is how this construction is, well, is, is able to work with, with a, a hurricane. And if you have time, we'll actually let you peep in our, our new children's gallery because you can build a chapel house from a template in there as part of that exhibition. But basically, he then talks about how windows have changed over time, uh, how the decorations for the house have changed, and he looked at things like this is done for ventilation um, in the taller houses, and again, how, again, when you were more wealthy, how you decorated the house, and how the roof has changed, the different types of materials, when people started getting wealthy and added on patios, how you could decorate your roof. And very, very sophisticated way of looking at it, how people fence their houses. Again, starting with the paling, you get a little bit more money, you do a fence, maybe a little chain link fence. As you got wealthier and you switched to stone, then you would have a, a wall with the crenellations in it. And of course, the very important job of naming your house and putting up a fancy. There's one on the outside of the door, I'll show you when we go back out and then how you maintain your house, what you do. Um, every year at Christmas, you have to paint your house. You have to put fresh marl down in front of the house, all sorts of, all sorts of, and he's captured quite a few of those things. And then what he did is he went all around Barbados and he sketched these houses wherever he could find them. And what he also did is where the house no longer existed when the book was published, he put a little cross in the corner to, you see, I, when I tell you, he had to be a part of this exhibition because there was obviously so much passion and so much saved from what he observed. And for each one he's, he's drawn, he's dated it, said where it was located, but it is really a wonderful catalogue of chapel houses in Barbados. So. And. This takes a while to get going, so I don't think I'm going to bother to do it, but what this actually is is a sort of an art piece um, which looks at different forms of chapel houses in Barbados and they sort of morph and change. Sort of, it's called AI Chapel, for Artificial Intelligence Chapel, and let's come down here on top of what's loading. Uh, so basically now we're going to go and look at, we're sort of moving outside now to go and play and socialise. So this is basically traditional games. Now, I'm sure you've heard about the importance of cricket in Barbados. So basically, in Barbados, cricket is played with whatever you can find. So that's actually a coconut tree branch, which is used for a cricket bat. That's somebody who just made a simple wooden bat that was carved out. We also have something called road tennis, 
which you basically mark with a tennis court in the middle of the road and you play with these panels and it's a hard wall. It's, um, we of course have the traditional wari that we've, we've inherited. We've also got jacks, we've also got a number of indigenous card games, uh, or own variations of dumbos. And these are what we call rollers, which are a simple push toy um, made from this used, this used and discarded ball bearings, cut out wooden wheels or wheels made from like old cans or whatever. But basically, this one has to make like our toy making workshops. This is what we would do. Um, you can also be reversed and use like a hobby horse. Uh, they also made rudimentary uh, scooters. I don't have a scooter on this way right now because we have people trying to get a scooter in the exhibition, which is not a good idea. <laughs> and it's almost impossible. But coming back over to the AI channel that you can see. That's how it starts out, and then what it will do, it gives you a little bit of a background as to why they privileged the chapel house. I'm going to stop talking for a minute so you can read that. And then what it's going to do is, it's going to do like a kind of a, not quite kaleidoscope, not quite, I don't know, but basically the houses will sort of morph into one another, but the photos will basically show you different variations of the chapel house. And it does that on a continuous basis for about half an hour before it restarts. Right, so going back again now, again for traditional recreational activities, kite flying is also very big in Barbados, and once again, we made our kites from whatever was available. So as you can see, the top one is made from newspaper. The one one is I basically discarded bits of paper and plastic. So like for example, once upon a time, the supermarket bags would come home from the shop and that would literally be what you were making your kite from. And these colorful patterns are once again very traditional. There's um, actually, I think, a YouTube video where one of our kite makers is, is um, interviewed and he basically makes a living just from making hundreds of these kites every year for Easter. It is traditional to do kite flying at Easter. It used to be a big thing on the garrison, not so much now because um, the garrison is a no-fly zone in the 20th century, but they'll still do at least one day homage, homage to that. But basically, um, we'll attach colorful tails and so on. And what some people do, they'll make like a really, really big kite called a bull kite with a very, very long tail. And certain times of the year in Barbados, you cannot sleep for listening to these kites because instead of bringing the kites down at the end of the day, they will tie the kite out for the night, go to sleep and come back, and understand that where the person is tying the kite is not where she's keeping noise. Because usually they're like a mile away. Because that's the next thing to it. The kite is big enough. It can really put it far out, high up in the sky. So we're talking like hundreds and hundreds of feet. So that's kite flying. And then, of course, we have our crop over festival. Um, not everything here is specifically crop over. For example, this is a traditional Mother Sally costume. And Mother Sally is a fertility image um, that we would have again passed on to the generations. But it is quite popular at pretty much every kind of festival event. And they also like to throw them out for the tourists to look at. But basically, exaggerated bosoms, exaggerated hips, exaggerated posterior, and a lot of dancing, um, usually to tukba music, which is a music which is a combination of both African drum beats and European military marches. Um, I will play some tukba music for you at some point in time just so you can hear. But basically, um, she's one of the many characters. We also have a shaggy bear. Um, we have a shaggy bear in the African gallery. I can just pop you over so you can see. And that's sort of um, our, what's descended from an abumbum is what, like what you would see in West Africa which is a sort of a figure to both speak to and ward off spirits. And this is a donkey man, not to be confused with the mythical steel donkey character. They're two slight different things. Um, a note actually on this. This character was traditionally played by a man in drag, but in the modern iteration, it is generally a trained dancer and a woman. But still a lot of the, 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 the same dance movements, a lot of the same idea. And of course, the tukman, which would be uh, people playing these instruments. So there's usually a bass drum, a snare drum, triangle, and also a flute. Um, 
the flute, there's another display somewhere in this in my Jubilee Gallery which does contain a flute. I would not give the flute much of a chance of survival in here, so we did not provide a flute for people to carry away. But oh, I promised to show you. So this is this year's rum top. This is from Cup Over 2020. So we are still using these things. At least still have a kind of a connection with these things, even though you know we can afford, we can afford fine crystal in China now, but that's not appropriate for Kaduma. And we want our rum top. It just sort of changed what we use it for. Um, the cup in that one down there is a mahara fat we bought specifically for the exhibition. The plate belongs to me. <laughs> in my house, yes, in 2020. My mom usually uses it for food prep. And I first got it to go camping when I was 11 with brownies. So <laughs> we, we use them. We keep using them. We continue to use them. There's actually something called the Topsy, which used to be Let's call it an oversized, it looked like an oversized enamel tea mug, but what it actually was, um, back in the day, a lot of our bathroom facilities were detached from the house. So it was what you used to go to the bathroom at night. Now, there are still houses in Barbados, not very many, which do not have indoor plumbing, but what you will generally more than likely see a top seat, because it's what we call it being used for nowadays, is for a very large serving of alcohol. <laughs> So, used for different things, but still used. So coming around here now, um, this is Phyllis Proggy Colomore. She would have been one of our earliest Calypsonians. She was born in 1931. So both, of, but basically before there was the mighty Gabby singing about Emerton and doing political commentary and social uh, protests like John King and so on, there were people like Phyllis Proggy Colomore. This is her guitar, and this is basically an homage to the development of our own um, undisputed forms of Calypso and so on in Barbados. Um, coming on down here now, we've already spoken about the Tuk Man. One of the things which was a, a link for the Tuk Man for us was the land ship. The Barbados land ship is actually a friendly society. Um, so as a sort of a community group which they helped one another they would save um, collectively and then the money would be used to help different people in the community either in the form of a loan or a grant depending on what was needed. It evolved into what was a modern day credit union and there's also this performative element because um, it's a sort of a combination of, of, of um, African society and then things that they copy from what they would have been seeing in early society. So the uniforms tend to copy naval uniforms from the day um, the female costume, the, the female dresses usually um, evolve from units like um, nurses and so on. And then this would be the Admiral, it's Admiral Watson, he's passed on now. But basically, um, the dance movements, which are done to, there's a combination again of, of African movement, but also with things like hauling in ropes in the ship and so on. So it's a kind of a combination of those two things. And these, again, are a group that you will often see at festivals, although the elements of, of community and fellowship, those have died out somewhat. Um, they, are, they, they still function that way, but with so many other options in the modern age, they're not needed for that as much, but the performative element is still very much there. And talking again about rituals and so on, um, we're looking again at some of the different types of religions which we would have being a part of Barbados society. So this is um, the Spiritual Baptist. Um, they are formed both in Barbados and Trinidad. In Barbados we call them the Thai heads because that is what large numbers of the cotton. So I actually didn't know they were called the Spiritual Baptist until I was an adult. Because I grew up, my mother, my grandmother, everybody, Thai heads. And you knew they were the Thai heads. But um, African spiritual rhythms, um, call and response, um, but they are an established Christian, I would say, religion with influences of certain parts of African spirituality. Um, we also had um, the Rastafarian movement, so this is actually uh, staff, sometimes people will, will call them the staff of Judah, but it's not necessarily all of the staff of Judah. Again, this is the Nayabingi flag, and that is the Lion of Judah. There's a, but basically elements of uh, that Rastafarian tradition. And then this case now speaks to sort of a more modern evolution. So there is of course the Bible, 
um, very strong Anglican influences in Barbados, which later morphed into Methodist, Wesleyan, etc. And then in later ages into what we call the Pentecostal churches, uh, of which the tambourine and the, or what we call the symbol is used as a part of a more, shall we say, upbeat um, ceremony as opposed to this, which is a little bit more slow, a little more prayerful, a little more ritualistic. Um, we have a small um, Catholic contingent. We also have small enclaves of Hinduism, Muslims, Buddhists, Baha'i, etc. All of which we try to represent as many of them as possible in this display case because Barbados is very much uh, a multi-Christian, not Christian, a multi-religious society. 